Uh, okay, welcome. Welcome to the uh, winter lecture series, or welcome back to the winter lecture series. If you were uh, fortunate enough to uh, to attend last uh, Sunday's talk, the uh, the series uh, is called "Polarization in America: Is Foreign Policy Different?" And we had a wonderful leadoff talk uh, last week by Tim Borstelman, who sort of gave an overview of American diplomatic history in that context. And if you look on your chat, uh, Bob Fusum, our technical assistant, was able to put up a link to last week's lecture. So if you didn't see it or you'd like to see it and hear it again, it's there. And uh, it will be available on the Unitarian Church YouTube site uh, that we gave you. Uh, well, it's in the it's in all the publicity. So you have that anyway. And and folks who are not listening tonight uh, are able to access it as well. That's a that's a public site. So even if someone isn't uh, part of this general community here in, in Lincoln, you want to send it to your cousin in Idaho, feel free or in in Uganda, for that matter. Um, we uh, we have uh, an hour and a half. Uh, during which time the uh, our our speaker will talk for maybe two thirds of that time, and then we'll have the remaining time for questions and answers and and comments and discussion if we can handle that as well. Uh, and we'll use the uh, the chat function to raise any questions you have, uh, and they'll be they'll be moderated by uh, Dr. Bob Fusen, our technical guy. Uh, at the end, of, uh, he'll repeat questions from the chat, and if we have the opportunity, you'll be able to unmute and ask a question or chime in uh, orally as well. Uh, I'm not going to take any more time except to uh, mention that next week, uh, our talk, we shift to another part of the world, uh, and our, our talk will be by Professor James Scott. Uh, from TCU, Texas Christian University, and he'll be talking on the polarization in American foreign policy, the case of U.S. policy toward Russia. So we'll be moving from uh, the, the Far East into uh, the Eurasia uh, next week. Uh, again, uh, just a, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, you are muted. You are muted by uh, by the system, and uh, we'll ask that uh, if your video is on, please uh, stop your video so we have full bandwidth and no distractions. Uh, we'll try to stop as close to 8.30 as we can. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to present to you uh, Professor Parks Coble, a distinguished Asian historian at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, who will introduce our speaker. Go ahead, Parks. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Megan Green, an old friend uh, and a distinguished scholar. Uh, Megan uh, did her undergraduate at Cornell, an MA at University of Chicago, and got her PhD at Washington University in St. Louis in 1997. Uh, she was a visiting fellow at Harvard, the Fairbanks Center from 1992 to 94. Uh, she taught at uh, Gettysburg College, School of Oriental and African Studies at, in the University of London and arrived in Kansas in 2002. Um, she is a distinguished scholar of the Republic of China, uh, both uh, on the mainland and then uh, when it moved to Taiwan with the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek in 1949, uh, she has followed its transformation into a democracy and economic juggernaut. She has uh, published extensively. Um, uh, some of her publications include The Origins of the Deve Developmental State in Taiwan, Science Policy and the Quest for Modernization, published in 2008 by Harvard, and um, uh, Building a Nation at War, Transnational Knowledge Networks and the Development of China during and after World War II, published in 2002. And she co-edited a volume, Taiwan in the 21st Century, 
aspects and limitations of a development model, published in 2007, and numerous articles. She's also been an important administrator among uh, the many positions she's held, uh, was head of the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Kansas. She's actually spoken in the Winter Lecture Series uh, one time before this in person a few years back, uh, but we welcome her on Zoom tonight. Uh, Megan, uh, welcome to the Winter Lecture Series. Thank you so much, Parks, and let me let me get myself sharing here. It always takes me a moment to to make these things work, um, and I'm going to have to get it into to. Ooh. slideshow right play from start there we go um can everyone see that or can can somebody let me know you see it yeah okay thank you um so so uh i parks that was a very kind introduction and and i i should say that that parks's scholarship i have i have always admired and and i you know i look up to you and in, in all sorts of ways so so I appreciate your generosity. Um, so, so I was asked to talk about China, Taiwan, and American politics. And I feel like I have to start with just a little bit of a disclaimer, which, which I think you should have gotten um, from that introduction, which is that I am a historian and not a political scientist. And so as a historian, I have a tendency to look to the past. Um, and and uh, and so I'm going to start off by doing that, and we'll get to the present. Um, but but I feel that we can't really understand the present if we don't think a bit about uh, about the past. Um, before I go on, I thought I would give you just a, a few names and terms because I I tend to use abbreviations and and I. I switch back and forth sometimes between Guomindang and KMT and nationalists. And so I just wanted to make it clear that when, if I mention the KMT, uh, I mean the nationalists who you, you, and you may be more familiar with that, um, that terminology. Uh, that's the party of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, uh, the Republic of China, I may call the ROC. There may be moments though when I'm using uh, Republic of China, ROC, and Taiwan interchangeably because after 1949, the ROC is in essence Taiwan, although what that means changes and we'll talk about that a bit. Um, and then the People's Republic of China, I may refer to as the PRC. Uh, I'm not likely to refer to it as Ch Communist China, but I suppose it's always possible I might. So, so just with those things in mind, um, let me talk, let me go way back for maybe not as far back as I could in this story, but but probably farther back than anyone um, of you might be expecting. Um, because I think it's really important if we want to understand where China's coming from in the 21st century to understand something about what China experienced in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, now I've put on this screen the phrase Chinese 19th century humiliation. Um, and I very intentionally used the word humiliation because I think that this is a, a way in which um, it, many Chinese frame uh, the, the, the period from the mid 19th century through to the mid 20th century as a, as a century of humiliation that begins with the Opium Wars, which I'm sure you've all heard of, the Opium Wars that 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 forced China to open in various ways uh, that it uh, had not previously been willing to 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 do. So this means uh, an, a new uh, coerced openness to trade with the West, with Western powers, um, to the opening of what are came to be known as treaty ports, because they're port cities that opened up under uh, as a consequence of stipulations that were made in treaties to end the Opium War and other wars. 
um, of, oh, I, that should say Westerners, uh, Westerners living in China um, under their own laws, right, under the principle of extraterritoriality. So, for example, if you were a British citizen uh, residing in, in China, you would be subject not to Chinese law, but to British law. Um, the, these things, along with the ceding of Hong Kong to the British, uh, again, as uh, as a, 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 a consequence of a treaty, um, the ceding of Taiwan to the Japanese, again, as a consequence of war and a treaty, uh, these are all humiliations that China endured at the hands of foreign imperialists, principally the British, the French, and the Japanese and the Germans, uh, but also the Americans. And so this is this is part of a context that we really need to remember if we're thinking about China in the present. I'll just explain the image that I put up there. Um, it's a it's a map of Shanghai in the 1930s, and you'll notice. Um, I. I think if I move my cursor around, maybe you can see it. You'll you'll notice that there's an international settlement. There's a French concession, right? And then there's a Chinese municipality of Greater Shanghai and an old Chinese city, right? So there are Chinese spaces, but there are foreign spaces as well. Um, and those foreign spaces were governed in distinctive ways, um, in in different ways. So these are actual territories in China that are kind of micro colonies, if you will. Um, and, and, and the the existence of these space, spaces um, created some kinds of opportunities and and uh, and possibilities for some Chinese. But in many respects, they were also understood to be, you know, a, a, a type of humiliation, right? That, that there were foreigners governing and controlling uh, Chinese spaces. Thinking about a, a more recent past then and continuing to, to, to consider questions of context, um, if we move on to World War II, we see a moment during which China and the United States uh, became allies, uh, very, very close allies. Um, and there's an image uh, on this slide of, of Jiang Kai-shek and Madame Jiang Kai-shek and J uh, Joseph Stilwell, and it looks like it looks like they're all giggling in front of the camera, um, taken uh, in in April 1942, um, and that image kind of conveys a, a, a closeness, um, which which wasn't always present in Sino-American relations, and wasn't always present in the relations that that, that American emissaries to China had with Jiang Kai-shek in particular, um, but that was there sometimes. And I think it's important to recognize that there is a, this very important moment in, in the late 1930s, but particularly in the early 1940s, where China and the US become quite close. And so the United States provides substantial aid to China during the war. This comes in the form of military aid. Uh, you may have heard of the Flying Tigers, for example, but, but there, are, there, are other, there are other kinds of military presence in China and assistance to the Chinese military as it's fighting a land war against Japan um, uh, while, while the United States is fighting a naval war against Japan. It comes in the form of technical advisors. And these, these are advisors who are working on uh, all sorts of things from from um, how how to how to grow crop you know how to grow there's a potato advisor who goes and works on a national the development of a national potato plan and tries to help uh, China to to cultivate healthier uh, healthier and, and and more robust potatoes that will feed more people um, so the technical advisors are not just people who are going and working on obviously and overtly military projects they're also working um, on other kinds of, of development projects in China in this period. And, and at the same time, in the early 1940s, there are hundreds, actually actually a few thousand Chinese trainee, trainees who are sent to the United States uh, to study various kinds of technical subjects. And those people are given, they're granted a, really free access to American industry um, and to 
state-run projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority, so that you have Chinese trainees, Chinese industrial trainees, engineers, and, and people in management who, who, are, who are working side by side with Americans in American factories and learning how to run the machinery in those factories and drawing maps and schemes and diagrams of that machinery and, and taking those notes home and thinking about how can we implement something similar in a Chinese context. And I want to, I mention all of this because I think that if, if we, if we, given the moment that we're in right now, where there's such an enormous amount of suspicion of what Chinese motives are. And, uh, I, and, and, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've just had a, a case at the University of Kansas of, 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 a, of a, a colleague who was accused of spying, um, right, of accused of being a Chinese spy. And, 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 uh, you know this this is this is happening around the country um and i think it's worth remembering that 70 years ago there was a very different kind of dynamic um it, it, to the us the sino american relationship so that's another piece of context uh thinking then also just sort of about how we get to the point uh of of a, a of a Chinese, Taiwanese, US sort of nexus of, 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 of tension, um, we need to remember also that in the wake of World War II, China uh, plunged itself into a civil war uh, between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party. And the Nationalists, along with the, their government, the ROC government, uh, retreated to Taiwan in 1949 as the People's Republic of China, the PRC, was being established. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, I wanted to, to note also the other image on this slide, uh, which is a picture of a food, distribu food aid distribution site uh, from 1948. Uh, so that we just are remembering that even, even during the Civil War, certain kinds of US aid was continuing to flow into China um, and, and food aid was, was a, a big type of aid in that respect. So I left us a moment ago then with the PRC being established in 1949 uh, in, in China um, and the ROC retreating to Taiwan. Um, and by 1950, 1951, we see the emergence of a new kind of anti-American rhetoric that's becoming increasingly strong uh, amongst, uh, amongst members of the Communist Party. And so this, this image, which comes, and uh, the, the, the colorful posters that I'm using um, in the slideshow almost all come from a, a, a truly wonderful website called ChinesePosters.net, which, uh, which is a website that collects propaganda posters from, from China. Uh, and it, it, I encourage you to, to take a look at it sometime because it's, it's, really, it's really awesome. Uh, they have just wonderful posters. And this is an example um, of, of one of those posters. So the caption uh, down below says, smash the imperialist war conspiracy, forge ahead courageously to build our, our ha peaceful and happy life. And this is from 1950 or 1951. You can't see probably, unless you're looking at this on quite a large screen, you can't probably see very clearly that there are a couple of human figures under the feet of the of this sort of marching army of people who are smashing the imperialist war con conspiracy and those those people are caricatures those are caricatures of truman and churchill uh, at the bottom so truman is holding a war plan and churchill is holding a plan to enslave the chinese people i wanted to put this up here because i wanted i wanted us to think about how you know it's at this moment in the PRC that US aid is starting to be understood and framed as having imperialist intent 
and not as being benevolent, uh, not as not as being something that comes out of um, an, an allegiance, uh, but as being something that is is done entirely in uh, the U.S.'s own imperialist interests. And I I also want to make the point that that I think that that framing um, is both true and not true. It's true in the sense that the U.S. spends money where its own in, and ha, and certainly did in the 1940s as well, um, where it understood its own interests to be, and and uh, that many, for example, many of the U.S. Ad technical advisors who went to China in the 1940s were people who worked in companies, and they were hoping hoping that after the war they would have an opportunity to sell their goods uh, in China. So for example, International Harvester set up uh, a, a whole program to train Chinese people and send them, and send them back to China with the, an eye to selling International Harvester's uh, various mechanized agricultural equipment uh, in, in, in the Chinese marketplace. So there, there, there is, are unquestionably, undeniably selfish and self-interested reasons for, this kind, for the kind of aid uh, that was being granted um, that might have a kind of a tinge of imperialism. But at the same time, there's a, a kind of a flatness and absoluteness to this rhetoric uh, that seems at odds with what had really been going on. Let's see, next. So thinking about then that moment in 1949 where we see where we see these two places split or this one place split into two. Um, uh, so we have a PRC and an ROC. Uh, one of the things that emerges fairly quickly is that neither party is willing to recognize the other as having any validity as a government. They both refer to the other as bandits. They both refer to the other as, as as being illegitimate states. They both claim to govern the entire territory of China, including Taiwan. This of course creates a problem. It, it creates a problem for all other states in that no state that, that recognizes one can then simultaneously recognize the other. You cannot recognize both the PRC and the ROC because they will cut off either one or both might cut off that relationship. Um, this meant that, for example, in, in, uh, in the UN security, the, the sort of relatively new at this point, uh, um, United Nations Security Council, uh, the China that had been given that seat, and I've given you Zhang and, and, and Zhang Kai-shek and Roosevelt and Churchill and Cairo here. I think that I think that decision about the Security Council may actually have been made in Yalta, so maybe this picture isn't from the right moment and the right place. But it gives you the idea, right, that Chiang Kai-shek was as 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 somebody who represented China amongst the Allied powers was negotiating certain kinds of powers and possibilities and opportunities for China. And one of those things that he negotiated was a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. But that, that seat went to the Republic of China. That means it stayed with Taiwan for some period of time. It did not, it did not stick with the space that constituted the bulk of China. It stuck with the government that had been in power at the time that the seat had been, had been granted to China. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out uh, then is, it, this is kind of shifting directions a little bit, um, is, is that it was not immediately the case, in spite of these, these kind of um, uh, recognition issues that were already starting to boil up in, in, in 1949, it was not immediately the case that the United States knew where it should stand vis-a-vis -vis China. The United States had had dealings with certainly a lot of dealings, uh, as some of the imagery I've shown you has has uh, suggested, with with 
Jiang Kai-shek and with the ROC government, but they had also had dealings with Mao Zedong and, and the Communist Party. Uh, and they had in fact attempted to broker truces and to get these two parties to work together, um, hoping to avoid civil war and to help China to figure out a pathway uh, forward. Um, uh, as, as a united China and not having gone through war. So in 1949, when it became clear that China was splitting into two, uh, the US didn't quite immediately take a very clear position. But with the outbreak of the Korean War in, in, in 1950, the, this becomes uh, a, a really defining moment in Sino-American relations. Uh, and it's at this moment uh, that, that uh, the US uh, begins to articulate and follow a in, a, in a very clear way, a policy of containment, containing, you know, drawing a line around the communist world, around the communist bloc and containing it. Uh, and that the US as, as a kind of a, a almost physical symbol of that line, uh, that Truman sends the US Seventh Fleet to patrol the Taiwan Straits and to, to make it very clear to the People's Republic of China that now Taiwan has come under the protection of the United States and that the United States understands Taiwan to be in, within its sphere of influence and not part of a, of a Chinese sphere of influence. And so if we think back on that image I was just showing you of, of you know, pushing back against uh, imperialist aggressors, you can see you can see that that decision to draw that line and that decision to put the U.S. Seventh Fleet in, into the Taiwan Strait certainly would have helped to to uh, to foster an impression in the PRC of the United States as taking as being imperialist aggressors, right? That they are are are, are bringing Taiwan into their fold uh, in a way that the PRC did not appreciate. Chiang Kai Shek, who was in Taiwan, of course, did appreciate it. Um, and, and so so there's a difference of opinion about whether this is a good or a bad thing uh, between these two parties. Uh, the, the image then, uh, the poster also from ChinesePosters.net, uh, the fate of the aggressors here on this slide, uh, which, which was uh, uh, produced in 1952 after the out, outbreak of the Korean War, shows, shows an American flag there draped over a body. Right, but it's an, a shredded American flag. It's an American flag, and presumably the body is an American body. We it, we can't see it well enough to know this. But the idea here is that the Chinese and the North Korean soldiers are are pushing back against these aggressive imperialists, these aggressive American imperialists. So then, thinking about going back to the UN story. And thinking about that UN seat, by 1971, there was a, there were enough parties in the enough nations in the UN who believed that the People's Republic of China should have the Chinese seat. That the that the, 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 the ownership of that seat flipped from the ROC to the PRC, and starting with that moment, then we see a gradual shifting of the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan and 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 China uh, through the 1970s. So that then under Jimmy Carter's uh, during Jimmy Carter's presidency and and uh, as a, a a decision on the part of the executive branch of the United States in 1978, there's the, uh, the United States de-recognizes the Republic of China in Taiwan and recognizes instead the People's Republic of China. Now, when that happens, uh, Congress, which felt that it had not been adequately, the US Congress, which felt that it had not been adequately consulted uh, on this issue, uh, decided that it needed to weigh in and let Taiwan know that it had not been abandoned. And so it then in 1979 promulgated the Taiwan Relations Act. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, tell you a bit about the Taiwan Relations Act because it's quite important to understanding what's going on today. So the Taiwan uh, Relations Act 
stipulates that it is United States policy to promote extensive, close, friendly, close and friendly commercial, cultural, and other relations between the people of the United States and the people of Taiwan. And you'll note that that wording is very specific, people of the United States and people of Taiwan, because of course, by 1979, the, U the US and Taiwan no longer had a state to state relationship. They had a people to people relationship. The Taiwan Relations Act also stipulates that peace and stability in the region were in the US interest. In other words, it's in the US interest to, be, to ensure that that part of the Western Pacific is stable and peaceful. It, also, it further stipulates that any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means is considered a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific, and thus it is of grave concern to the United States. It further states that the United States will provide arms to, to the Republic of China for its own defense, and that the United States will resist any resort to force by any party against Taiwan. Now that terminology isn't, that language doesn't quite go so far as to say, we'll fight China for you, but it certainly implies it. Uh, and so this has been the governing document for the relationship between Taiwan and the United States since 1979. And part of what's been happening in the past year or so, uh, well, less than a year, really, since August, maybe, um, has been a kind of a fleshing out of that document in light of, of current Sino-American relations. I'll get, to, I'll get back to that a little later. So now I want to turn to Taiwan during this long period um, from, let's say, you know, the 60s or 70s uh, up into the 2000s. And, and think about some of, some of the things that Taiwan did, well, really from the 70s on. Um, think about some of the things that Taiwan did in order to protect itself in this very uncomfortable position that it found itself in after it lost its seat in the UN Security Council and, 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 and also lost its position on you know, other kinds of uh, multinational non-government or, uh, uh, organizations like the World Health Organization, for example. Um, and, and, uh, and after the US also derecognized it and, and it lost uh, the full weight of its American patron, patron. So it still had some weight from its American patron, as I just was describing when I was talking about the Taiwan Relations Act, but it didn't have the same heft that it had had when, when it was recognized uh, by the United States. So in the 70s and 80s, there was a very, very concerted and intentional effort on the part of the state uh, in Taiwan to promote economic development. And the state was facilitated in its efforts to do this by the fact that it was governing under martial law. It wasn't a democratic system. Um, it, there were local level elections. So there was some kind of practice in democracy that people engaged in, but decision-making about economic policy, decision-making about being, about, about about social policy about virtually anything was uh, was governed by a, a one party state uh, that that was pretty much pretty much in lockstep, uh, and so it was not very difficult then uh, the, for for the state to push the kinds of policies that it wanted to push because nobody had nobody who wanted to push back really had mechanisms through which they could push back. Uh, so these developmental policies have since that time, been criticized in, in a variety of ways um, by, by, uh, by people who would have liked to have resisted them at the time, uh, or by people who simply felt that they were too heavy handed. 
But at the same time, it is undeniably the case that in the 1970s and 80s, uh, Taiwan took a, a path of economic development that allowed it to gain over time an outsized kind of, of economic significance uh, relative to the size of the nation, or the size, no, sorry, not, not nation, the size of the territory um, and the size of the population, which at that time was probably around 20 million people. Um, and we're talking about a, a, a physical space uh, that is about the size of Illinois. Um, in 1987 then, uh, Taiwan took one further step, also partly because there was a demand for it domestically, but partly because I think it, it felt like the right thing to do in order to retain the kind of public support uh, that, that, that they were seeking to retain from around the world, which was to democratize, to lift martial law and democratize and give people the vote and give people the opportunity to participate in, in a robust participatory uh, democracy. Now, that presented some challenges because the constitution that Taiwan was being governed under had been had been promulgated in 1946 when the Republic of China was still located in, in China. Uh, and so one of the big challenges was who's voting for whom, right? And where are these people, what are these people representing? And this compelled Taiwan to undergo, or the ROC to undergo uh, a number of constitutional revisions in the 1990s that did not go as far as they might have in terms of declaring Taiwan to be an entirely separate space from China, that is declaring it to be independent. Uh, but, but instead, the constitutional re revisions stipulated that voters would, would be voting, in, if would be people who were located in the free area of the ROC, which meant Taiwan and the small islands in the Taiwan Strait that, that the ROC controlled. And that has continued to be the, the way the way the voting population of the ROC is, is understood still to this day. Um, now, because the because people in Taiwan had the opportunity to vote, and now it was no longer since martial law had been lifted, it was no longer illegal to to have a political party uh, other than the KMT. Uh, other political parties began to emerge, and the most the, the 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 biggest and strongest challenger to the KMT was the Democratic Progressive Party or the DPP. Uh, and so, over the course of the late 1990s and the 2000s, you begin to see voters expressing a preference for the DPP. So that in in the year 2000. Uh, the first DPP president of the of the ROC is elected, and then again in twenty oh gosh when was she elected? Uh, twenty twenty maybe it was. Um, uh, Tsai Ing Wen, uh, a, a second DPP president, uh, was also elected. Uh, so so that there actually has been now over the last 20 years uh, an ebb and flow between the DPP and the KMT in the executive branch, which is a, a sign that this is a really functional and robust democracy. One of the interesting things about the DPP is that their platform from the very beginning has always emphasized and called for Taiwan's independence from China. However, they have never acted on this. Now, the reason I've given you a picture of a, of a passport uh, cover from Taiwan um, is, is to make uh, the point about just how very complicated Taiwan's um, it, political identity is. Uh, so you'll notice that, that at the top, in, well, you, in Chinese, it, it has the name up here, it has the name for the Republic of China. In the circle on it, it also says in English, Republic of China, right? So this is the formal name uh, of this government. But down lower, right above passport, it says Taiwan in, in pretty big letters. 
uh, and those letters have grown over the years, uh, to make it increasingly clear that whoever holds this passport is a resident of Taiwan. Now this isn't, the passport cover isn't a declaration of independence by any stretch of the imagination, but it is an assertion of a distinctive identity for the Taiwanese people. Uh, China, the PRC, on the other hand, has had an unrelenting position that Taiwan is a part of China. This is something that 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 has never never been unsaid uh, by by a PRC government. It is it has been consistently held through throughout this period uh, from 1949 uh, to to the present. Uh, that is that is in spite of the fact that in the 1950s and 60s the PRC articulated a very, very strong kind of anti-KMT rhetoric. Uh, and that poster down at the bottom, uh, the, the, the caption of which says, liberate Taiwan, exterminate the, the remnants of the bandit Jiang Kai-shek that comes from 1954. And you see this, you know, People's Liberation Army soldier shoot, aiming a gun uh, at, the, at, the, at the leaders of Taiwan, get rid of them. Um, you know, and liberate Taiwan from from their from their control, right? So there's a strong anti-KMT rhetoric, but it's not an anti-Taiwan rhetoric. There's a desire to bring our Taiwanese compatriots, our Taiwanese brothers, our Taiwan brothers into the fold. And you can see that articulated in that other poster up above, which shows, you know, a very, uh, uh, a very happy and joyful looking um, reunion uh, of, of, of people with a, a boat in the background and, you know, suggesting that, that, that the pe peoples from the PRC and peoples from the ROC are getting together. It's also the case that as a sort of backdrop to that rhetoric in the educational system, in the press, there's been a real uniformity of message uh, about Taiwan, certainly in the 2000s, uh, but, but these, these ideas go back uh, in time as well um, it, to, to this notion of, of a century of humiliation that I talked about earlier, right? That, that China has suffered under this, that Taiwan had been had been colonized by the Japanese. It had only just in 1945, at the end of World War II, been returned to China. Um, when then it was occupied by these bandit KMT people, and and that who who whose uh, whose power and authority over Taiwan has been bolstered by the American imperialists, and that this needs to stop. Right, that that Taiwan continues especially in its connections to the United States, to be a representation uh, of that, the continuation of that old century of humiliation. There's a strong sense in, in Chinese uh, rhetoric that, that it is super important for China to recover all of the territories that it lost through that century of humiliation, and that includes Taiwan. Um, but there's also a goal of peaceful reunification, right? And this, this has been consistently articulated for, for the Chinese public um, over time. However, we also need to think then in contrast to that, that Taiwan holds considerable, considerable utility for the PRC government as a domestic propaganda tool. Um, uh, and and that that whenever uh, the government uh, of the PRC is challenged in some way by some sort of internal crisis, uh, it can pull out Taiwan um, for to as a as a as a tool with which it can rally nationalism, uh, and this get this happens uh, time and again. Uh, so you know there are protests about COVID. Like protests about the zero COVID policy, protests about about uh, about the restrictions on people's lives, uh, 
and and China, you know, one of the the ways in which China can the PRC government can respond to this is through deflection, right? Say, well, you know, this is very important. We're doing this, but at the same time, oh, look at how look at how the Americans are dealing with Taiwan, and this is outrageous, and we should focus our attention uh, on on this very critical political issue, right? So it's a kind of deflective. Uh, strategy that also helps to rally a sort of a nationalism. I had this other poster that I just wanted to show you. I think I actually I think it's quite lovely, um, and and uh, it's from 1978. So so it you know reminds us uh, of that that this this idea of of unifying the mother country, right? Unifying China is not one that just came up yesterday, right? It's one that has been very constant through this whole period. Um, and this is that, that title on, that I put on the right of the slide is a translation of, of the Chinese. But I also wanna draw your attention to a couple of things about this image. Um, one is, you know, clearly that you have a, a, a bunch of, of, of people who look like they're from China, uh, communist China, right? Uh, you've got people in green who look like PLA soldiers. You've got someone in, in, in blue who, who looks like he's probably a party cadre. You've got people from a Navy. They're all looking off. They're, they're looking off to the, to the, to the East, right? They're looking towards Taiwan. Um, they're, they're behind them, and you, you may just be able to see this, there are some anti-aircraft tanks. And right above the anti-aircraft tanks, uh, or guns, I guess, sorry, uh, right above those guns, uh, there's a slogan. And, and I, 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 part, at least part of that slogan is reminding, reminding people that they, that they should be trying to liberate Taiwan. So there's there is both a kind of a peaceful ha hopefulness about this. You know, you've got flowers, you've got the the beach, you've got these this beautiful scenery. Um, but you have all you have the anti uh, anti aircraft guns. You have the people who are in in military uniforms, um, and they're all looking towards Taiwan. So that so that there's a there's clearly a, a military dimension to this as well. Uh, and and that's something that we can't forget. Um, so China, uh, in this period, and particularly over the last twenty years, has invested increasing uh, amounts of its GDP in building its military. Um, and I, I wrote. I put the word expansionism here. That that may not be exactly the right word, uh, but certainly extending its sphere of influence out into the oceans surrounding China. So, whereas in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, even 70s, China really didn't have an, an, a navy. Um, over the course of the last 20 years, and, and especially the last 10 or so years, China has been growing itself into a considerable naval power. Uh, and I've, I've put here an image of the first uh, aircraft car carrier that was uh, con constructed in China prior to that uh, the launching of that aircraft carrier, China had also purchased aircraft carriers from other states and re, you know, rebuilt them and 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 made them their own. Um, uh, they have used aircraft carriers, but they've also done some rebuilding of of um, of uh, 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 or or maybe building expansion of, of very small islands uh, in the South China Seas and, and, and built uh, airstrips on those islands uh, as a way of extending their military um, uh, abilities, their military positions and, the, and, 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 and their military reach out into the South China Sea and therefore down further south and in, into, into the sort of Southeast Asian um, uh, realm. And this is, has not sat well with the Philippines and, and with Vietnam uh, and with Indonesia, uh, but, and it's also not sat well with Taiwan. 
Um, so, you know, from the Chinese position, this is about asserting authority over space that it understands to be rightfully within its sphere of influence. It's trying to reclaim that sphere of influence from other foreign powers and most particularly from the United States. So the Chinese would describe this as a defensive posture. Others, certainly China's near neighbors, certainly Taiwan, um, but also the United States read these actions as being aggressive postures. Uh, another example of a, of, of a of, and this is a much more recent example um, of Chinese uh, military action in a in an oceanic sphere that that has been previously understood for quite for decades to be more within the U.S. sphere of influence are the military drills around Taiwan that China was were the military exercises around Taiwan that China was uh, engaging in um, after Nancy Pelosi's visit in in August. So whereas in 1996 when China wanted to uh, make the point that it, that, that, that it was upset over the direction that Taiwan's politics seemed to be going in um, as the Taiwanese public looked likely to be uh, electing a, a, a president who had a pro-independent stance, what they did then was to lob bombs into the ocean off the ports, uh, the southern port of Kaohsiung and the northern port of Geelong in Taiwan. Um, but what they were able to do it by 2022, so this is 20, what, eight, six, something, eight years, six, 26 years later, uh, what they're able to do is to have actual naval exercises in this area, which tells you that their capacity uh, within, in the naval realm has been radically transformed in that period. So now the United States getting getting to, you know, why do we care, right? Um, well, I mean, there are a lot of reasons we care. We care because we're heavily dependent on Chinese manufacturing. And if that didn't become incredibly apparent uh, as we all looked to all of us, as we looked at our at the empty shelves in stores during the during the worst of the pandemic, um, then, 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 uh, then we were missing something big. I mean, it was it was right there in our faces, right? Um, but China, as I just mentioned, is a rising military power with a goal of regional dominance, uh, and that is something that that threatens China or the the U.S.'s perception of its own relationship to that region, uh, and and the power and authority that the United States has exerted in that region in the post-World War II era. Um, I think the US is also reasonably concerned about the growth of Chinese nationalism um, and the ways in which the Xi Jinping government manipulates and mobilizes and tries to harness that nationalism, especially as China's economic growth has slowed and as China has gone through this really challenging uh, long-term period with COVID. Uh, and so, you know, in China, there's this articulation of a Chinese dream that is kind of like the American dream, right? But it's the Chinese dream. Um, and the Chinese dream has been about economic development during this long period where the when when the PRC government was was able to oversee and foster very rapid, steady economic growth that was that the, the majority of the population was benefiting from. Um, but by by, you know, the, over the course of the last few years, that economic growth has has slowed considerably. Uh, and so the Chinese dream has taken on a much more nationalistic dimension uh, and our character set of characteristics. And so Taiwan and the role of Taiwan and the idea of reunification and the idea of making China whole and the idea of ending that century of humiliation once and for all, that has become a really important dimension or piece of the Chinese dream. Um, and it's also, a, it's also important, uh, it, it, the, the, the idea that it's the party that is guiding all of this, right? That China 
unlike Taiwan, China has not democratized. China is still a, a, a state with a single party government. Um, and it's the party that is aiming to make China great. But the party can only do that for as long as the party stays in power, right? And so it, it's, 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 it's important that the party retain power in order to be able to do that. It's sort of a, a, a cyclical um, or, or self-fulfilling kind of, uh, a, a, of situation wherein the party has to retain power to make China great uh, and, and making China great will also keep the party in power, right? So there, it's a sort of mutually dependent idea. China also, as we have seen time and time again, is unwilling to, and has been consistently unwilling to in, 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 since the, the beginning of the establishment of the People's Republic to, to yield to pressure from external sources. Uh, and, and so it, it can be very challenging to negotiate with China because, because whatever decisions China makes, whatever decisions the PRC government makes, always have to seem to come from the PRC government. And, and so you can't, it, it's not easy to use a heavy handed approach with China and expect that they're going to yield and that they're gonna give up. Um, and then finally, the last thing I wanted to say here, and, and, and this is why, you know, I've got images of, of a, a balloon that we've all been hearing about recently and, and, uh, and, and a reference to TikTok. Uh, and, and of course, the reference I made earlier to, you know, Chinese nationals residing and working in the United States being accused of spying, um, that there, there are a lot of concerns and some of them are completely legitimate and justified and others are, are, are the consequence, I think, of a certain degree of hysteria um, about Chinese, Chinese spying. Um, and, and, and and the ways in which the PRC government may be seeking to, to use knowledge that it is gleaning both about American industrial practices and about, uh, and about just hu human data, right? The, 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 the thing, the, whatever they know about, about us from, from, apps like TikTok or, or, or through various systems that Huawei might be uh, um, supporting, um, to use those things in one way or another to China's own advantage. It could be for its military advantage. It could be, it could be for some sort of propaganda advantage, uh, or, or, it, or it could be uh, for industrial or economic advantage. There are any number of possibilities there. I only have a couple more slides, but I'm going to keep going for a little bit. Um, so thinking about the U.S. reasons to support Taiwan, I mean, to me, they're pretty obvious. It's a thriving democracy, right? It's really lively. Uh, it's, it's an exciting democracy to watch. Um, and even if it has its own dysfunctionalities, it's, it's, I, I like watching it more than I like watching our own democracy work. Um, but but we've got uh, we've also got you know some significant economic interests in Taiwan, um, and I've got a picture of part of part of a microchip here, uh, and you can see from that that part of the microchip that it was made in Taiwan, right? Taiwan is the is is the largest single microchip manufacturer in the world. They they have uh, uh, sixty one percent of the global chip making capacity and 92% uh, of advanced uh, microchips are manufactured in Taiwan. So, so there are many, many things that simply could not work in the United States uh, that if we suddenly lost access to all of those microchips. So we do have a very strong and compelling economic reason um, to want to, to, to see Taiwan's economy continue to operate uh, as, and its industry continue to operate as it does. But of course, the U.S. also has an interest in, in I think, in, in pushing back on China and in preserving its own Pacific power. And that's something that maybe, maybe needs to be thought about, discussed rethought, I mean, is it really appropriate for the United States uh, this far out from World War II to still understand 
that that far Western Pacific region to be part of its sphere of influence? I don't know. We're still there because for historical reasons. Um, and I'm not saying we should leave. I'm just saying that I think it's I think it's a subject for that's open for for discussion. As I mentioned when I talked about the Taiwan Relations Act from 1979, we do have a treaty commitment to continue to, to support Taiwan, to provide uh, it, it with the defensive cap capabilities that it needs. Um, and we might even, again, I, as I mentioned before, that's the wording is a little vague in the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, but we might even have a commitment uh, to, to go to war. Uh, if anyone were to use force uh, against Taiwan. In 2022, uh, the Taiwan Policy Act uh, increased military aid and loans to help Taiwan's military modernize um, a, a, in order to protect itself against China. Uh, and, and so that's, that's something um, that very concrete that was done to try to make the Taiwan Relations Act a little more robust and to sort of reassert that commitment. And that happened just in, in December, I think it was. Um, uh, so, so I'll finish with this, you know, with this image of Nancy Pelosi and, and President Tsai Ing-wen in front of, uh, in front of an, a picture of Sun Yat-sen who was a Chinese revolutionary, right? And the father of the Republic of China, Tsai Ing-wen as a democratic progressive party president uh, who believes that in Taiwan's independence um, still, still uh, operates you know, as president of a government that, that even if it puts Taiwan in big bold letters on its passport, is is still a government uh, that is the government of the Republic of China, and that at least nominally has some sort of claim to the to the to the territories uh, that are that are China. Um, in August 22, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, and I thought, oh damn, everything's going to go to hell now. Um, and I was I was pretty worried about this, even though I was really I mean, I, I was glad to see her go and i thought i mean i thought that it was a, a a show of solidarity that that was wonderful but i just didn't know what xi jinping might do um the taipei times which is which is a, a independence leaning paper called pelosi a comrade in arms in the fight against tyranny and the pursuit of liberty right well what's the fight against tyranny it's the fight against the prc right and what's the pursuit of liberty it's it's the pursuit of independence for Taiwan. So that there were certainly people in Taiwan who interpreted that visit and, and the American, that the, 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 the sort of statement that it made to have someone of Nancy Pelosi's stature coming to Taiwan um, at, as, as a support for Taiwan's independence vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic of China. Although I'm not sure that's exactly what Nancy Pelosi was intending. Um, in September 2022, President Biden seemed to commit repeatedly, uh, in, in orally, uh, to the idea of defending Taiwan. So to the idea of taking the Taiwan Relations Act as far as it could go. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have, as I mentioned before, the Taiwan Policy Act, which increases military aid and loans to help Taiwan's military modernize and protect itself against China. So US, the US has been taking a position over the past seven or eight months that is more aggressively and overtly pro-Taiwan than US governments have taken uh, in, in, since 1978. Um, and I really think that they're doing this perhaps partly because of what Taiwan has become, um, certainly partly because of what the PRC has become, and, and partly because I think there's a game that is being played between the United States and China um, about who is going to, uh, how, what their relationship is gonna look like in the future and, 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 and who, who will have authority and power in that in that Western Pacific region, 
um, in the coming years. So that that is what I have to say. Um, and I wonder if I should stop my stop my uh, sharing and just open it up. Should I do well, that? Yes, yes. But please. first, first we have the opportunity uh, to thank you for that uh, illuminating talk uh, from a historical perspective. Um, I'd like to take the before we get into the questions, and there are about six questions, and Bob will will uh, curate the questions and read them. But I want to take the prerogative of the chair here and ask a question first. The theme of the uh, the series is bipolarization in American foreign policy. Uh, are there two sides? Or is the United States 100% in favor of, of, of Taiwan? Is there any bi bipolarization in this issue at all? And I guess I should have talked about that, but I didn't. The, um, um, yeah, well, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say less, less than in a lot of other, like in most other realms, I think. Uh, if we go back to the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, that's a bipartisan act. There are more Democrats supporting it than Republicans, but there are a lot of Republicans supporting it. The, 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 the people who proposed that bill were coming from both parties. And, and that I think really signals uh, a, a sort of, uh, a, a, well, wh what that may have spoken to more than anything else at that moment was congressional dissatisfaction with the fact that the electoral, the, the, that the uh, executive branch had not consulted Congress before uh, switching the recognition from, from the ROC to the PRC. Uh, so maybe that was a kind of a, 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 a false unity that was just because because everybody was mad at Jimmy Carter, um, but but uh, in in the time since then, there are certainly hawks and doves on China, right? And if we look at you know U.S. China policy in the Trump era, um, and we think about uh, you know uh, um, especially after the outbreak of COVID, but not only after the outbreak of COVID. Uh, we we see a sort of relentless um, uh, construction by the Trump administration and the Republican Party of China as the enemy, um, and and that that was not wholly new, uh, but it ballooned during that period, and I feel that that one of the things that I'm finding very interesting in watching um, watching the Biden administration navigate uh, the, the Chinese, the Sino-American relationship is, is that while Biden's rhetoric, of course, is dramatically different than Trump's, uh, and, and I, I mean, you, you know, you can't compare the two, it, it, in my view, it, it, uh, in, in terms of their 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 capacity uh, for diplomacy, um, or uh, but but uh, it is still the case that a lot of that kind of anti-China rhetoric that became so deeply and embedded in the American kind of mode of of talking about China and thinking about China of the Trump era hasn't really gone away. So so that in the last two years we still see China positioned as and understood as and thought about as the enemy. And we're still seeing um, you know, all of this concern about Huawei and TikTok and spy balloons and so on. And I don't think that's just because Biden feels that he has to, that he's somehow pinned down by by a, a set of feelings in the American public, I think it's partly because the Democratic Party also is concerned about China's rise. So the level of concern and the rhetoric that the two parties use, I think is distinct, but there is clearly concern on the part of, 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 of both groups. So, so I don't see it as, as being, I, I, if you had asked me that same question four years ago, I would have said super polarized, right? Uh, but I, I actually think that that those these ways of thinking about 
China as, as authoritarian, as as um, as uh, anti-human rights, as as spies, uh, as threatening to U.S. interests. Uh, all of those things are, are are concerns that are shared by leaders in both parties. And I and I think that you know Pelosi's visit to Taiwan is a manifestation of that. Thanks. Go ahead, Bobby. There. Go go for the questions out of the chat. Okay, uh, Dr. Green, the first question from the chat. Can you briefly explain? I'm sorry, it's the wrong one. Regarding the 1950s poster, the people look well fed. Were they really that well fed, or was there famine? Um, and I can't remember exactly what year. With, with, uh, I think I had posters from like 1951, 52, and 54. I'm not sure I had any from as late as 58. Uh, but in that early period um, in the 1950s, there was probably some famine in some areas of China, but by and large, actually coming out of this very long period of war, uh, agriculture in China was doing reasonably well. And, and, and so if we're looking at the Chinese economy in the early 1950s, it's improving uh, and things are getting better and people probably by and large, I'm not going to make the claim for everybody, but by and large, people were better fed than they had been at previous points uh, in, in the 20th century. Um, but uh, if you're thinking about sort of that period from 1959, 60, 61, during the Great Leap Forward, when there was this great massive famine, um, and, and you know many, many, many people died. Of, of, of famine, uh, the posters from that time did not reflect the, 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 the famine at all, right? So, so the Chinese poster art does not always reflect the reality of what's going on um, on the ground. All right, next question. Can you briefly explain how Stalin and the USSR fit in this history from the 1940s to the 1950s? Yeah, that's, that. you know, I'll say I, I could I I'm probably not the best person to ask because I don't tend to think that much about Sino-Soviet uh, relations. Um, other other than to say that uh, certainly certainly the Chinese Communist Party uh, during the late 1940s and in the in the early 1950s, le leading up to about 1956 or so, was was getting a considerable amount of aid uh, from the Soviet Union. Um, some of that aid went uh, to assist the Chinese Communist Party in, in terms of, uh, of, of the execution of the war, um, the Civil War, uh, but more of it came probably in those very early years of, uh, of, um, of the People's Republic of China, um, during which time the PRC promulgated a five-year plan, which was a very Soviet uh, strategy uh, for, for planning out economic development. And that first five-year plan was undertaken under the advice of, of Soviet advisors, but also uh, with the, um, with the uh, assistance of, of, of Soviet aid, um, in particular industrial aid. So there's a lot of factory development uh, that is happening during that period, industrial development that is happening um, uh, because the Soviet Union is sending technical advisors and sending actual materials to build and construct factories. Uh, so, so that the USSR is, is quite actively assisting the People's Republic to get itself on its feet and to start building and developing its economy. By 1957-58, that is something that Mao is really beginning to wrangle at. Uh, and in fact, I mentioned the Great Leap Forward just a minute ago, which is a Maoist political movement that led to these massive, massive famines. Uh, um, that movement was, uh, was in part a re repudiation of the Soviet strategy for economic development and an attempt to assert a much more Maoist approach uh, to developing. All right, our next question from the chat is, 
Kindly explain whether Taiwan was a member of CETO, and if so, what was the dynamic of that treaty arrangement with the U.S.? I cannot answer that question because, in fact, I, although I've heard of CETO, I don't know and I don't remember. Um, so I'm going to say might be good to check Wikipedia on that one because I, I, I don't have a good answer. Bob, I'm going to go to the next question. Okay. At some recent moments regarding Beijing and Taiwan, say when Nixon went to China or Carter formally recognized China, how much bipartisan support existed for those U.S. policies? Or did each U.S. political party fracture with critics and supporters within each party? How hard has it been to build consensus in the U.S. in support of shifting U.S. foreign policies? Comment on consensus in support of a hardline policy now regarding Beijing. Well, I think I've I've I think I've answered the latter part of that question as well as I can um, already in response to Peter's opening question. Um, but thinking about the earlier period, um, I think there was a lot of uh, uh, you know, and I'm not I'm I'm not a specialist in U.S. politics. I work on China, um, but my sense of it is. Uh, that that uh, that when Nixon went to China, there was um, a, a certain amount of concern about that. And really, I really I think Nixon's the only one who could have done that, right? I mean, he was he was the pres he was a Republican president, right? He, he was he was the president. He was the head of a of, of a pretty hawkish party um, that had been taking a fairly a uh, strongly anti-communist stance for some time, um, and and in, in that role, he he much more than you know a, a Democrat who might have who who might have been understood to be you know, I don't know, pandering to the hippies or something. Um, he could go to to China and and meet Mao Zedong and have have these conversations and open up pathways. Um, and make the case that it was the only thing that could be done um, in light of China's growing power, um, in, in, in light of the massive population um, of China, um, and, and, uh, and in light of the potential for economic engagement and economic development between the two nations, right? So that there there were possibilities that could be that could be realized if there was an opening of pathways uh, that that couldn't that that couldn't be as long as they were refusing to talk to each other. So I think that Nixon was being very pragmatic. Now whether that was um, accepted and understood by everyone in his party, I have the sense that probably not. Uh, certainly, when Carter formally recognized China, um, there was not there, there 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 were you know a lot of people who were quite upset about this, and and I and that's how we end up with the Taiwan Relations Act, and those people are you know friends of the Re Republic of China who had been friend you know who were who were high level politicians in the United States who had been friends of the Republic of China for for decades in some cases. Um, and I mean, and and I mean, I mean that in a literal sense as well as in a kind of uh, uh, diplomatic sense. Uh, and and so I think that that decision was was it caught probably caught some people by surprise and was certainly not something that 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 everybody was willing to get behind. Um, and and I think that was the case in in both parties. Uh, so that. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure how much I. Ha I haven't observed that China policy has necessarily created great fractures within within either party in the U.S. at any of these junctures. But I think it creates little fissures. Maybe is is, is a better way to to say it. Um, and and tensions. And it has also created some alliances across parties. Uh, that may have been unexpected, but that are are kind of the consequences of 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 um, of of that. I guess of the oddity of this situation. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Our next question is, how can Taiwan ever trust the peaceful overtures from China after they have observed how China reneged on its promises to Hong Kong? Yeah, you're spot on there. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, and I don't think they do. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and I think, I think the, you know, people in Taiwan have watched the Hong Kong, you know, have watched events in Hong Kong unfold over the past, you know, 26 years, uh, and they've watched them very closely. And they're, they're fully aware of, of, of how the PRC has, has, uh, has dealt with Taiwan as, I mean, sorry, has dealt with Hong Kong and has systematically over time um, uh, stepped, stepped back or rolled back guarantees uh, that, that it had uh, made in its agreement with Great Britain. Um, you know, so there, there. I, if I were, I mean, I don't trust what they have to say. And if I were a resident of Taiwan or a citizen of the ROC, I wouldn't. I would trust it even less than less than I do from my my position as an American. Our next question is: How supportive is China regarding Putin's adventures in the Ukraine? No, that's pretty euphemistic. Um, yeah, well, I think we've seen that, you know, just in the news in the last few days, right? The, 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 that there's, you know, the Chinese, the, the PRC government is, has, has historically been very unwilling to, to interfere in anybody else's domestic business. And, and, uh, and they, they do that. They 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 take that position because they don't want anybody interfering in their domestic business. And so, for example, when the United States makes comments about you know human rights abuses in China or or you know or in Xinjiang with the treatment of Uyghurs, for example, you know the response is often well, a a, a we're not doing that, right? But b uh, it's none of your damn business because because this is a domestic situation and we're governing our nation in in the way that our nation needs to be governed, you know, and and with the consent of our people, um, and and we let you govern your nation in the way it needs to be governed and with the consent of your people, and and so and so I think that it would be quite odd and out of character for Xi Jinping to take a stand against what Putin is doing in Ukraine, partly because Putin has articulated that as a domestic issue, right? And not as an international issue. Um, he sees this as a process of sort of reclaiming lost territories, uh, at least in part. And, and so it would be, it would be inconsistent in terms of that. It, the, the, what I was just saying about domestic issues, but it would also then be very problematic for the PRC to criticize Putin for doing that and then to continue to make the claims it makes regarding Taiwan. And I'm not saying that Ukraine and Taiwan's situations are, are the same. They're, they're slightly similar, but they're similar enough that, that, that I think that that inconsistency would be that, that, that would, you know, logical inconsistency would be problematic. Uh, and so I think that seen in that light, it's almost, it, it's almost impossible for Xi Jinping to do other than, than he's doing, although he could be, I mean, he could be opting not to not to meet with Putin, he could be opting not to offer the, the whatever types of support he's offered in terms of purchasing Russian oil uh, and whatever other kinds of of economic assistance that he's given to Russia um, over the past year. Uh, so I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but part of it at least. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, has the way China China handled Hong Kong and the Uyghur population awakened both parties in the U.S. to what might be their intentions regarding their actions in Asia as a whole? Well, I would say that 
China's, I, 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 I think that there might be a bit of an assumption embedded in that question that I think is problematic. And I, because I think that the assumption there is that there is some sort of expansionist or imperialist um, set of goals that China has with regard to occupying other territories that, that, uh, that have not ever historically been Chinese territories and, and, uh, and suppressing or repressing um, uh, ac activities in those anti-Chinese activities in those territories and for almost forcibly bringing them into a Chinese orbit. Um, and I do not think that China seeks to do that. I, I emphatically do not think that they seek to do that. I think that what China is trying to do is to regain control of territories that were part of the Qing dynasty. So part of China in the 18th and 19th centuries. And that includes Hong Kong, and that includes Xinjiang, and that includes Taiwan. And with those territories brought back into a whole, you know, and becoming a part of, you know, making China complete again, then, then that mission has been accomplished, right? So the one space that needs to be, that needs to be occupied still and brought back into China is Taiwan. Um, and, 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 and I don't think that China has expansionist aims elsewhere. Now, I do think that China has been expanding its economic influence. I think it's been, you know, and it's been expanding its economic influence well beyond Asia. I mean, you can, you can see the stamp of China all over Africa, all over Latin America, um, and, and in, in various other parts of Asia. So, so the, the, this is, you know, you could regard that as a kind of a, of a, a neo-imperialism, but it's not, it's not an imperialism that is about occupying territory or controlling people uh, or bringing them under Chinese domination or, or Chinese authority. The reason that the Chinese government believes that it can handle Hong Kong and Xinjiang in the way in which it's, it, it's doing um, is because those are Chinese spaces and it wants to ensure that, that, they, that they operate as Chinese spaces in a way that they can recognize uh, as, as, being, as being healthy and well integrated into a Chinese sphere. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I, I deeply disagree with the approach that, this, that the PRC government has taken um, to repress, repressing freedoms uh, in, in, in both Hong Kong and amongst the Uyghur population. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I couldn't, I'm appalled by a lot of the things that they've done. Um, but, but, but I understand the reasoning that they're using to articulate it. And, and it's very clearly a, a, a about domestic policy. It's not, it's not about having designs on other places. All right, we've got one last question here in the chat. Is there a societal rift between the native Taiwanese and the Chinese who arrived in 1949? Yeah, that's a good question. There really was. Uh, in, in, in and that that came out very strongly um, in in the you know in the nineteen I spent a fair amount of time in Taiwan in the nineteen nineties, um, and you know everybody you talked to was like would they would identify themselves as you know I'm mainlander or I'm Taiwanese right I mean people's people's identities in in that respect were were really strong and sometimes people were, you know, clashing and, and really at odds with each other uh, over that. And that was partly because it, it, it was a, a conversation that couldn't be had under martial law because the repressors were mainlanders and the people who were being repressed were not all Taiwanese, but many of them were Taiwanese. And, and so, but of course the people who were being repressed couldn't, couldn't say, you know, stop repressing me, this is bad, you know? Uh, so that there, there's this, there, there was 
a, a societal rift that could not be articulated during the martial law period, which lasted until 1987. And it was articulated very strongly then in, in the 1990s and even the first decade of the 2000s. But increasingly, since around 2000, people have been thinking of themselves as Taiwanese. And that includes people whose parents or grandparents were born in the mainland China, um, because the people, people who migrated from mainland China in 1949 are getting fewer and fewer, right? I mean, they're dying off. Uh, so there, there aren't that many of, of, of those people anymore who have that really, really strong sense of place in China. And most of the people in, in Taiwan now have a strong sense of place in Taiwan. And so even if ethnically or, you know, in terms of their family history, they're not Taiwanese, they still see themselves as Taiwanese. You know, they're residents of Taiwan. They're people who, who understand themselves to be Taiwanese in some way. Uh, and so that, I think that rift has been kind of going away uh, in, in more recent years. It's not completely gone. Well, Dr. Green, thank you so much. Uh, we finished exactly at 8, oh, it just hit 8.31. So we're about as close as we can get. But uh, thank you so much for this uh, this talk. Uh, we're going in sequence. We've uh, had the first two talks by historians, and now we're moving for the final two talks to political scientists uh, next week. And by the way, Megan, you you have the link. You're welcome to uh, to watch the next couple of weeks as well. But uh, Professor James Scott of Texas Christian will be talking next week about uh, the case of U.S. policy toward Russia. And that's something we all know something about. And I think that we're uh, we're waiting to hear what insights uh, he gives to us. So thank you again. We've all enjoyed it and we appreciate the, your preparation and your presentation. Well, thank you for such wonderful questions. And it's been a real pleasure to, 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 to do this, so. Okay, thanks all and good night. Bye, thank you.